Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. Sometime in 1937, a male witness saw a man-like creature climb out of the Saginaw River in Saginaw County in Michigan. The creature climbed up the riverbank and leaned against a tree, then returned to the water. The witness suffered a nervous breakdown. The man-like creature was very hairy. Lake monster or hairy humanoid? Or a little bit of both? On to the next one. I remember my first encounter very well. It was the summer of 1944. I was nine years old. It occurred in Alger County, Michigan, near a post office called Eben Junction. It was at my grandfather's farm, which was at the edge of the Hiawatha National Forest. My mother and aunt were pulling rhubarb from a patch next to the woods. My male cousin and I ran off in the woods to play a favorite game. This is the kicker. We would take small, dead, second-growth trees and whack them against live, bigger trees, trying to hit each other with the pieces that flew off. After doing this for some time, we stopped and looked around for some reason. The opposite side of the wood lot was not very far, and the sun was bright. What we saw was a huge man standing broadside to us looking at it. He was huge, and as we looked, he turned and walked away. We flew out of the woods and told our mothers, but they just said it was the neighbor man. Well, it was not a man. We never went into that section of woods again. Did our knocking on the trees draw him in? I don't know. The other witness was my cousin, who's now deceased. On to the next one. on Hayes Tower Road in Ostego County in Michigan. I was using the outhouse right after I'd woken up at about nine in the morning. I was in the outhouse when I heard a rustling of leaves and sticks breaking. This wasn't unusual as we have a lot of deer near our house. The noise kept getting closer and closer. At this point, I figured that it wasn't a deer because it was coming so close to the outhouse. I hastily pulled my pants up and opened the door. I saw Bigfoot. He was very much like other people have described him. Tall, hairy, and muscular. He looked like an oversized monkey. As soon as he saw me, he took off into the woods. Later that night, my whole family heard screams. We assumed it was a Bigfoot eating a deer, but we weren't sure. The rest of the family heard the screams, but I was the only one who saw him. It was at nine o'clock in the morning. It was clear morning with no fog. On to the next one. In Calhoun County in Michigan, in May, Mr. Otto Collins, Mr. Philip Williams, and Mr. Herman Williams were out hunting when they met up with a tall, big, hairy humanoid that smelt vile and had green eyes as big as light bulbs, which picked up two of the three witnesses by putting one under each arm and commencing to carry them off. Herman scrambled for a gun, and as he was doing so, this hairy humanoid dropped the other two who made their escape. On to the next one. I'm writing this for my neighbor, Bill, not his real name. I interviewed Bill. Bill said that when he was a teenager, he went with a group of 11 relatives and neighbors from Detroit camping in the upper, lower peninsula of Michigan. They camped west of Twin Lakes in northern Calcasa County. The group was made up of several men, about seven boys, ages 7 to 12, and Bill. 
They arrived on a Friday morning and set up camp about 50 feet from the road and in a spot where no one else had camped. They cleared away the underbrush and built two rings of rocks for their campfires. The two rock rings were about 30 feet apart. It was early spring because Bill recalled there were still patches of snow on the ground under the trees during the trip. In the early evening, they roasted marshmallows and hot dogs, the children sitting around one campfire and the adults around the other. From behind where Bill was sitting, a rock was thrown into the campsite. About 15 to 20 minutes later, two more rocks were thrown into the camp in quick succession. The rocks were about the size of cantaloupes. Each rock landed and rolled only a few feet, suggesting the rocks had been lobbed upward rather than thrown directly into the camp. The rocks had been thrown from beyond their camp clearing. The edge of the clearing was at least 30 feet away from where the rocks landed. With the first rocks thrown, everyone thought someone from their group had thrown the rocks as a prank, perhaps while taking a leak in the forest. But when they looked around and saw that everyone was at the campfire, they realized someone else was throwing the rocks. I asked Bill what their reactions were to the rocks landing in their campsite. Bill said that they were surprised and thought it was weird that someone would or could throw such large rocks, but no one was alarmed. Bill said that one of the adults had a firearm in his tent, but he did not get up to get it. Early the following morning, Bill got up and drove west towards State Highway 66 in order to buy some supplies. He recalls that he was driving with a learner's permit, so one of the adults rode with him. The road they were on was a narrow, hard dirt road without a maintained clear shoulder. It was like a fire road or logging road. Bill had driven about 10 miles west of the campsite when he saw a large animal come out of the forest on the north side of the road. It emerged from the forest on all four limbs until it reached the road. On the road's edge, it stood up and walked across the road in two steps. The first step was in the middle of the road, the second on the other. Because the forest edge along the south side of the road was dense, the animal immediately vanished from sight as it re-entered the forest. When Bill saw the animal, the sun was behind him and still very low. The trees cast long shadows, and he was about 50 yards from where it crossed the road. So he recalls only that it was bigger than a bear. Its hair was darker red than a deer, and he was impressed by the strength of force of its stride. When Bill got to the spot where he had seen the figure cross, he stopped briefly but didn't get out of the truck because the adult he was with told him to drive. The adult had been sleeping when the figure crossed the road and awoke when he stopped the truck. Because he was driving with a learner's permit, he was 15 years old. He thought about what he had seen during the rest of the trip to the store. He thought what he had seen matched descriptions he had heard or read about Sasquatch, but thought Sasquatch was only seen in the Pacific Northwest. He had not heard of sightings in Michigan. So when he got to the store, he asked the store owner whether he had heard of any local Sasquatch sightings. Bill did not mention anything else. Most of the group saw or heard the rocks land in the campsite. Only Bill saw the figure cross the road the following morning. Bill was excited by what he had seen. When he got to the store and described his observations to the owner, the store owner was fairly nonplussed and said he had heard of several other sightings in the area of a large unknown animal. The first incident, rock throwing, occurred in early evening before 9 p.m. The second incident occurred in early morning. The weather was cool enough to still support snow patches under the trees. It's relatively flat terrain with dense mature pine forests. There were many bogs and small ponds in the area. Bill thought that the area was more forest and natural in the 1950s and 1960s than it is today. On to the next one. In Cass County in Michigan, 
A nine-foot-tall, hairy humanoid with shining eyes was seen that was making whimpering noise. There were many individual witnesses. On to the next one. This event happened when I was still a law professor and the university would not have approved of one of their faculty reporting on such a controversial subject. So I kept it to myself. This incident happened to me and my wife Penny back in 2008 on a camping trip in northern Idaho. And for years, I've wanted to tell someone, besides my close circle of friends, it's good to see that there are others who have had the same thrill of discovery. But at the same time, it's too bad that we can only share it safely with those who can believe in it, because we've all shared the experience. Penny and I had always wanted to camp somewhere that was so remote that we could realize total privacy with only the forest dwellers to share it with, to experience the solitude. We wanted to find our adventure in a truly wild area, within sight of civilization, but only from a long ways up. We traveled to Idaho's Lake Ponderé. The place we had chosen to begin our adventure off was Lakeview Road, and we parked our vehicle on a remote curve on this road, where we could pull off far enough behind some pine trees so as to be totally hidden from the road. We then loaded up two monstrous backpacks and headed into Coeur d'Alene National Forest in the direction of Echo Bay off of Bernard Point. We had stayed overnight in a motel back down on the highway so as to get an early start, and with many rest stops to accommodate, an out-of-shape law professor, we spent the long summer day hiking northeast until we found a place suitable for an overnight camp. The next morning, we arose to a loud rapping sound that we assumed must have been a woodpecker working on a tree full of bugs. That was a suitable alarm clock, so we prepared a quick cold breakfast, packed up our gear, and then headed through the heavy and deep forests again toward the lake. By mid-afternoon, we had selected our perfect camp, a flat, grassy spot surrounded by beautiful evergreen and oak forest, with a stream of sparkling water running alongside a tent site that seemed to have been created just for us. We cleared the area, put up our tent, and dug a latrine down below our camp in a small circle of young pines. To reward ourselves, we took a short hike up to the peak in order to view the lake. Lake Ponderé is the largest body of water in Idaho. That night, as we were relaxing before a picturesque campfire, we again heard a distinct rapping. Only this time we knew it could not have been a woodpecker because the sun had set and it was already pitch black in the inner forest. The sound was like someone smacking a baseball bat on a hollow tree, which I have done before. It's sort of a deep, reverberating sound. The noise would consist of a half dozen or so raps, and then silence for a time, and suddenly there was an answering series of similar sounds, way off in the opposite direction from where we were at. It was unnerving, but we weren't frightened. We simply had a sense that someone or something was communicating, like a mating ritual or something. Penny and I discussed possibilities, which ran the gambit from bull elk claiming the territory and even to the possibility of a group of the type that had established a neo-Nazi encampment near this area years before, but had finally been run out by the federal government. There are some very remote areas in northern Idaho, and at least we knew that humans could not navigate these forests without light, so we could at least rest knowing that only animals could come close, and bear or cougar would likely stay away from humans. Not hearing any more sounds other than an owl and the far-off howls and yipping of what sounded like a pack of young coyotes we slept peacefully. 
The next morning, we woke with the sun and stepped out of the tent to greet the day. But something was different. The coffee pot was not by the fire pit. It was laying under a large tree, and my backpack had been removed from the stub of branch on the large fir tree that I hung it on. We found it down the hill below camp and behind a thick stand of blackberry bushes, and it had been opened. The zippers had broken, as if someone had just pulled it apart without using the zipper. The contents had been removed as though someone or something without knowledge of zippers and fasteners had used enormous strength to rip it apart. Several of the MRIs, meals ready to eat, packets had been torn apart. The contents poured and scattered about, and it was like a big, strong creature had been carelessly inspecting the contents. A bag of marshmallows was torn open, and it appeared that most of them had been eaten or carried off, but the torn bag remained. After we cleaned up the mess and prepared breakfast, I went to the stream to fill the pot that we boiled water in, and Penny visited the latrine. When on her way back, she yelled, Paul, come over here and look at this. When I got to her, she was leaning over a spot in the creek, just staring at the sandy shore by the water's edge. There were two huge footprints that appeared to be about one and a half times larger than my size 11 and a half hiking boot. The prints looked human, except for the obvious claw-like marks at their tips. We had heard of Bigfoot before, but like most people, we casually dismissed the reports as most likely bears and wishful thinking of wannabe adventurers. However, this was different. It really had happened, and to two fairly educated people. Penny is a high school principal. So, there we were, trying hard to rationalize a bear that left large humanoid footprints, and that lifted my backpack quietly off a tree branch five feet high, and went through it with us only 20 feet away. Well, we cleaned the area up and stayed close to camp all that day, rather than hike up to view the lake again. Later that afternoon, we heard a series of raps again that sounded like whatever it was had moved closer to our camp. Still later on, we were startled by an even louder series of beats, and they seemed a lot closer to us. By this time, we had begun to feel most unwelcome, and we reached a point where the enjoyment of nature had lost its appeal. So, we warily camped again that night, and the next day found us rapidly hiking back to our vehicle. Our GPS unit returned us to the welcome side of our car, and we heaved a sigh of relief when the engine started immediately. We had been concerned about that, as we were really anxious to just get out. Then, as we were, as we were crawling along our meandering trail back to the gravel country road, a creature darted across the road about 50 yards ahead of us and we both concluded that it had to be a bear running on its hind leg. Then we ruled out that possibility, as it looked too much like a large ape, but it didn't seem to have a neck. We hadn't seen it for more than seconds, and it was angled toward us, so the shock of it seemed to blur our memory. We never spoke much about this incident, and only to a very close circle of friends. Usually, we kept it light, to leave room for the ribbing that always followed. But we had experienced something that compels a person to want to share it. Then, as it happened, a fellow professor invited me to accompany him to a Sasquatch symposium in Oregon, which was chaired by the well-known anthropology professor, Dr. Jeff Meldrum from Idaho State University. Dr. Meldrum's presentation was most interesting, and I came away knowing that I finally had the answers. As far as no neck, Dr. Meldrum explained that the Sasquatch actually has seven cervical vertebrae, but appearance would suggest that it has no neck because its massive skull is highly mounted. Now that I'm retired and have time to explore, I no longer have the desire to chase out to find this elusive beast, but as I enjoyed hearing others' encounters. 
Hopefully, your listeners will enjoy mine. On to the next one. I'm a corrections officer at a county jail in northwest Alabama. I work a 12-hour night shift. Most nights are calm and not much happens. But other nights, you're moving nonstop and police officers are constantly bringing people in. You have a lot of DUIs, drunk under the influence, and junkies on weekends. And then anything from a failure to appear in court to the occasional murder throughout the regular work week. Sometimes a single shift can make you feel like you've been here for weeks. Those calm nights are not really all that calm. We have two holding cells in the front of the jail used to house inmates that have recently been booked in and are waiting to see the nurse for screenings before going to the gen pop. General population, the main area prisoners are kept. We have another room up front we all call the pink room. Due to the walls and ceiling being painted a hot pink color, because a former sheriff thought hot pink was a charming color, everyone hates this room. It's our drunk tank equipped with a camera for observation and a flushable drain in the floor for any liquid that might come out of someone. One night, after lights out, when everyone was asleep, it was around 2.45 a.m., I heard a loud bang in one of the holding cells, like someone was hitting or kicking the door, which would have been normal noise if anyone would have been inside one of them but my partner and I had moved everyone out of the two holding cells just a few hours before, and no one else had come in that night. I thought it might have been one of the guys we were keeping in the pink room for medical observation, but when I looked over at the monitor for the camera in there, he was sound asleep on his mat on the floor. I went over to the doors of the holding cells to investigate. I lifted the heavy curtain on the windows so I could see into each one, but there was no sign of anything. I figured I was just hearing things since that noise is so commonly heard at all times of the day and night. The place was completely silent until about 3.05 a.m. I started hearing the noise it makes when a door is unlocked from the control room where you can unlock or open any door in the facility except for three you need an actual key for. There's a door right behind the desk I sit at that leads to a kitchen and a rec yard. That was the door that sounded like it was unlocked. I radioed my partner, who was in the control room, and asked if she had unlocked this door. She said that she hadn't touched the computer since I asked her to let me outside and vape around two hours before. Again, I thought it was a common noise to be heard. The silence was playing tricks on me. Then I heard it again, except this time it sounded like the front door. I looked over at the monitors for the front door and saw nothing. But on the monitor for the pink room, I could see the screen starting to get fuzzy like static. Then it went completely black for a few seconds. When the camera came back on, the inmate was sleeping in the same spot, but everything he had in there with him, his cup, shoes, blanket, was scattered across the whole room. I would have heard him moving and throwing things, but it was completely quiet for those few seconds when the camera was black. After that, I decided I didn't want to be alone anymore. I went up to the control room with my partner and started telling her what was going on. After I told her about the doors unlocking and locking and about the guy stuff in the pink room, she just laughed and said, must have been Christine. My partner has been working here for five years now. She told me that Christine was an inmate that had died in the old jail next door and that the reason she haunts the jail is because the buildings are connected. She told me about numerous things that have happened while she was on shift, including actual sightings of the ghost she calls Christine. She said 
Christine has gray hair down to her shoulders and wears a white nightgown. She also said that Christine can be seen walking down the hallway on the cameras, inside the cells with her hands on the bars, looking through them, and sometimes you can see her face from the windows outside. On to the next one. I'd worked for two years as a security guard and was offered a job as a night guard on the grounds of an old hospital. The hospital was closed and awaiting demolition. For months, the place was fenced off from the world. My job was to patrol the grounds and, if need be, check inside the building to make sure it was kept clear of anyone breaking in or squatting. The hospital was really creepy. On my third night shift, I heard a crashing sound come from inside the building. It was about 2 a.m., and the area was so quiet, I almost jumped out of my boot. I radioed through and said that someone was in the building. I was advised to check it out. I'm over six feet tall and can look after myself. Even I found it a little intimidating with nothing but a flashlight and a radio. I followed the corridors and most of the doors were locked. I got to a big theater room, which was eerie. It still had a bed in and old fashioned equipment. I couldn't tell if anything was out of place as it wasn't exactly tidy. I heard a loud bang and turned to see a door in the room had slammed behind me. There was no wind or draft, so I thought there had to be someone in the hospital. I panicked, thinking someone was there, and ran to open the door. It was stiff, but it opened. There was no sign of anyone. Then there was a clink behind me, as though a small metal object had been dropped. My heart was in my mouth. I didn't believe in ghosts, and expected to turn and see a teenager laughing at, a, at the prank, but when I turned, there was no sign of anything. I could then hear what sounded like footsteps in the corridor. I ran through, shining my flashlight, but there was no sign of anyone. I checked the building over and the outside perimeter fence. I couldn't find any sign of anyone breaking in. The morning came, and the guard came to take over for me. When I told him what had happened, he just laughed and said, Ah, so you met the ghost? I told him I didn't believe in ghosts. To which he said, you will when you've worked here a little longer. I only lasted a couple of weeks and found another job. I couldn't cope with the strange, unexplainable noises. The hospital was knocked down months later, and now there are new houses built over the area. I never used to believe in the paranormal, but there is no way I would live in one of those houses, even if I were given one for free. On to the next one. I used to work for a state mental hospital as an orderly. The new building was built on the ground of the old one, with many remaining structures used as administrative buildings and a halfway houses. The whole place had this strange dark aura about it. The basement where supplies and drugs were stored always creeped me out, even in the day and not to mention tragedy seemed to fall upon many who worked there. One particular evening, I was working there on one of the admission units just as they were starting construction on the new kids' wing and doing some remodeling. We had to move the patients and supplies to a new area while they redid their unit. Many of the mental health patients don't care for change. A few of the regulars were getting edgy. I was sent in because I was the only person that was able to reason with them and calm them down. We moved to a new unit without another incident. I got out at 11.45 p.m. and began my 30-minute journey home. I lived in a small New England town back then, so woods as far as the eyes could see and no street lamps until you were on one of the main stretches of road. I don't know what time it was, but... I just turned onto the main road that leads to my street. Instinctively, 
I glanced at my rearview mirror to make sure no one had snuck up on me, and I darn near go off the road. Looking back at me was a man, sitting in my back seat. He had a round face, short, dark hair, a beard, and dark eyes. I turn around and see the back seat is empty, so I freak out and pull over to search the car. I find nothing. I figured it was just a long shift. The light was playing tricks on me, so I get back in and drive home. I pull into the parking lot of the duplex. It's in the middle of nowhere, so I only have the entry light to guide me in. I open the door, toss my keys down, and then go upstairs to take my shower since everyone else is already asleep. I get out to dry off, and my cat at the time comes in to greet me. I bend down and start petting when it makes that odd noise cats make when they hear something. It turns its head abruptly to the door and runs to sit at the top of the stairs, switching its tail. Then suddenly, I hear heavy footsteps coming slowly up the stairs, and my heart drops. I'm standing in the bathroom with nothing but a towel on, and my husband is fast asleep in another room. The footsteps stop. The cat runs off, and there is nothing there. By now, I figured I've gone insane, and I just heard the neighbors and nothing else. I go into my room. My youngest is sleeping in the middle. So I just nudged my way in and went to sleep, until a strange creaking awakens me. I was still half asleep. I hear this odd noise, and suddenly a loud bang startles me awake. I jump up, screaming, and wake my kids and husband, who flips on the light, ready to confront an intruder. But much to our shock, the only thing we find is our TV sitting straight up on the floor, having somehow been ripped clean of the wooden studs we had it mounted on. The following night, I go back to work, and nothing seems unusual, until I get a frantic call from my husband, telling me to call him as soon as possible. I finally do, and he says, You'll never believe this, but we have something in our house. I was like, What the heck are you talking about? There's nothing in our house. He goes on to tell me that he had just put the kids to bed and went outside to look for something in his car. When he looked up, he saw a man walking around our living room through the windows. Naturally, he thought some psycho was in the house to rob us or hurt the kids, so he ran inside but found no one on the first floor. He ran upstairs, but it was only the kids. He also scoured the basement, but the door there was locked as always. He came back upstairs and saw a black mist floating in the kitchen that vanished as soon as he saw it. He was somewhat freaked out over this incident, and the next week was strange too. Odd noises in the house, things being moved about, and the cat refused to go upstairs. The next week, I was on the admission unit again, and I go up to John, an orderly that has worked there for many years, and ask him if his normal unit is haunted. He looks me straight in the eyes and says, Oh, you must mean Frank. Another orderly standing around the group asks who Frank is, and John tells us he was a young man who died by suicide on the unit three years back. He tells us that he is doing safety checks that night and found the body, but since Frank was a heavy guy and hung himself from the door handle, they couldn't get the door open in time to save him. He tells us that on occasion, the door to Frank's room will refuse to budge and that he thinks it's because the guy just wanted someone to save him. I went home that night, sat on the couch, talking to Frank. I basically apologized to him for no one getting to him in time. I said how sorry I was he had to die. I also told him that no one could save him now but himself, and that he had to cross over if he wanted to find peace. The next night, the house went back to normal. To this day, I'm not sure if Frank hitched a ride back to the hospital or if he made the decision to go to the other side, but I hope it's the latter. I hope you enjoyed those encounters.
And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!